Amen. Thank you. It's good to have Brother and Sister Knuff with us again. Amen. 2008, January 2008, the last time he was here. And I'm looking forward to this week. Amen. What the Lord has for us, Brother Knuff, why don't you come and preach to us, Brother? Amen. Good to see you again. Still love this pulpit. Last time I was here, I was going to try to get it in my van, but I don't think it would fit. <laughs> this is a scroll table, Jewish synagogue. I'll put it to good use here. An old and a new testament on it. Amen. 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 I appreciate your prayers and, uh, and kindness toward us. And Lighting us up here again. Uh, we're from Kannapolis, North Carolina. I guess our greatest claim to fame is Dale Earnhardt. <laughs> My wife was raised about a half a mile from him. And uh, of course he moved to Mooresville, so he didn't spend a lot of time in Kannapolis. But you know, most people either hate him or love him. I, I, I don't care much for racing, so it, I'm sort of indifferent. But um, we've had a uh, eventful time since the last time we were here. Of course, you know you were in the other building, and we've been we've traveled a whole lot. Uh, and I've been in, out of the hospital a couple times. The cancer that I had in 2006 affected my heart, and uh, they had to do an ablation where they go up into your heart and they burn a vessel on top of your heart to neutralize it because it was uh, I developed atrial flutter. And so I thought that was taken care of. Then back in July, I got out of rhythm again, and they had to go in and shock me back into rhythm. That's when they stop your heart and then shock it back in rhythm. So it's been in rhythm ever since. And so I just live one day at a time. <laughs> but this is the furthest we've been away. We live exactly from my driveway, our driveway, to your pastor's home. We live 681 miles, I think. The way it goes. Coming through Pennsylvania is pretty adventurous, but we uh, we are glad to be here. And um, I, we are absolutely just I don't I'm just taken aback by what you've done to this building. Now we were here four years ago. You had the building, and the head start was down here, but none of this was done. And plus the house, their house. In four years, I don't know how you get all that work done. Somebody's, <laughs> somebody's got a mind to work around here. And I walked in here, this is just tremendous. And I thought that you were going to put the church down into the head start place, you know, with a little stage and all that. But this is uh, this is tremendous. And you can grow. you got plenty of room to grow with this building. <laughs> and it's this fascinating what God has done. And I am very thankful. I have, I, I'm serious about this. I was just as excited about this, I think, as you were. And I have told everybody everywhere I go about you uh, being able to get this building and how God worked it out. And so uh, let me tell you this. Uh, this is not an advertisement, but if you're, uh, if, if you're looking for a good church and you're not a member here, this is the place you ought to head in. Because I know your pastor and his wife, and I know what they believe, and I know what they teach, and I know what they stand for, and I'm right there with them. And so uh, if you think that good churches are just a dime a dozen, they're not. Down in our area now, you know, we're in the south, and it's often called the Bible Belt, but something's happened to the Bible Belt, that's for sure. But down in our area, uh, the two-mile radius, there's five independent Baptist churches. But they don't mean they all believe the same. They should. But they say they all believe the King James Bible, but they have different music, and, and uh, sometimes their music is not scriptural, and it's you know it's really it's it's really you know it's heartbreaking to a great degree. But you got something good here, and I hope you know that. And I like to see this church grow. Where you have to keep adding more chairs all the way to the back. That's great. And I've sat on these chairs before. They came from Charity Baptist, their old building, and I was up there too. So. But your pastor has given me the liberty to do whatever the Lord led me to do this week. Now, you know, we were here four years ago. All we did was have a Bible conference. And we have uh, done a lot on the King James Bible since then. Uh, 
I have, I have been able to compile quite a few uh, different studies since I was here last time. I did one on the, called the Trail of the Translators, which uh, shows what the King James translators had when they sat down to translate. And so I've done that several different places. And uh, Fellow in the Church puts all that stuff on our website. So it's on there. It's on Charity's website too. So if you're, in, if you're interested or glutton for punishment, you can log on to that. It's just MitchLCanup.com. Isn't that, isn't that imaginative? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a domain website, and I don't even have a computer at the house. This fellow at the church does it. It's his idea, my pastor's idea. I said, okay, you guys are going to run it. I'm not. Because I'm not real literate when it comes to computers. <laughs> but, uh, in any case, uh, so they run it, and if I get any correspondence, they get it, you know, and and uh, they, they give it to me, and then I answer back. I usually just call the folks on the phone, you know, the old-fashioned telephone. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't even know how to send an email. So I'm displaying my ignorance before you this morning. <laughs> All right, take your Bible, if you will, and turn three places this morning. Uh, first of all, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 22, and we'll read a, several verses there, and then we'll read a couple verses out of Joshua chapter 5, and then in Hebrews chapter 2. Now, I prayed about what the Lord wanted me to do this morning, and uh, I believe this is it, I believe this is exactly what He wants me to do. And so, I am an evangelist. For those of you who never met my wife and I, I am a, I, God called me to preach late 1976. I was saved in 74. Started preaching January of 77 in rest homes, nursing homes, in prisons, and things of that nature. And uh, I had no intentions of doing the, the thing that I do on the Bible. Because I knew what people would say. Well, you're following this man. You're following this man. You're following this man. And I didn't. I had no intentions. And I'm going to tell you something. I might have said this the last time I was up here. I love being around people. I love people. And I love uh, fellowshipping with them. But I don't like driving. And so God calls me to be an evangelist. Now you figure that out. Uh, driving just wears me out. And, uh, but but I, love, I love getting there. And I love being there. And I hate to leave after I get there. But uh, that's what God said to do, so that's what I'm doing. But uh, so we have, the last uh, oh, 30 some years, we have preached, and in 95, the Lord opened this door. People began saying, come do something on the King James Bible. Because they knew I had done it in different places. And so I started compiling things together, and that's been about, uh, that was in 95 when we started traveling full time. But uh, so it's gone from there to this. I hope you get a blessing this morning out of what God told me to do this morning. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse number 1, the Bible said, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Dom. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, that's the only reference you'll find in your Bible with the word discontented. Gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. Now you put a bookmark right in there because we will be going back and forth to this passage. But look over in Joshua, Joshua chapter number 5. In Joshua chapter number five, now you know the uh, the narrative here. They had gone in to, to and and, and, and uh, getting ready to fight against Jericho, following that same trail that Jesus Christ will follow when He comes back at the second advent. Crossed over the Jordan, and in verse number thirteen, Joshua meets a very unusual person here. The Bible says it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand and Joshua went unto him and said unto him art thou for us or for our adversaries? 
And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. And said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. And that's the manifestation of the angel of the Lord. That's called in theological circles a theophany. That's the angel of the Lord, folks. That's Jesus Christ as the angel of the Lord. You know that so because Joshua fell on his face and worshipped and he wasn't rebuked for doing it. And the Lord himself said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. So there we have a manifestation of Jesus Christ before he was born in Bethlehem. You'll find it all through the Old Testament. You find it in Judges 13. You find it in the book of Genesis. The angels that came unto Abraham before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So we find Joshua takes off his shoes because it's holy ground. You say, why? Because God's dwelling there. That's why. All right, look over in the book of Hebrews. Notice he said, the captain of the Lord's host there in Joshua. Hebrews chapter number 2. Hebrews chapter number 2, the Bible says, a very familiar passage of Scripture in verse number 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Father, give us wisdom now as we look to your word this day. I pray you would bless us in a great and a mighty way. Help me as I try to preach this message. May you be glorified and magnified in everything we say. If there should be one here this morning that doesn't know you, not acquainted with you, I pray, Lord Jesus, your blessing will be done today. And you'd save that individual. And we'll thank you for what you do. Strengthen us from the Word of God this morning. And we'll thank you and praise you for what you do in the name of Jesus Christ, our loving Lord and our Savior. Amen. I'm going to preach this morning on the captain of our salvation. The captain of our salvation. That's obvious from the Scripture that uh, David presents us with a glorious type of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you know your Bible and you study much in your Bible, you'll notice there's many Old Testament uh, saints that are a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. My favorite one, my favorite character in the whole Bible is other than Jesus Christ is Joseph. And Joseph is a type of Christ in about a hundred particulars. And David is a type of Christ, but you know, none of the types ever meet the full qualification of the antitype. And the antitype is Jesus Christ. You say, why? Well, uh, Joseph sinned. So did David, but Jesus Christ never did. Amen. But David is a type of Christ. And so back in our text, look back in our text, and I want you to notice in 1 Samuel chapter number 22. Notice in that second verse. As David went down, of course you know the narrative there, he was fleeing from Saul, and Saul had tried to kill him. Saul becomes a type of the Antichrist, and of course David's a type of Jesus Christ. But you'll notice in verse 2, and everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. I want you to notice uh, in our passage this morning how, how this type, this David is a type of Christ is fulfilled in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You say, why? Well, folks, I don't know about you, but when I got saved, I was in distress. Amen. Amen. I was in debt in more ways than one. I was discontented. I wasn't satisfied at all with life. I don't know if I told you if any of my testimony when I was here before, but I was 18 when I trusted Christ as my Savior. I had dabbled since the 8th grade in rock bands, and that was my ambition. Boy, what an ambition. It's to be in rock bands. I don't have that good a voice, but I had a pretty good voice for rock music. All you got to do is scream it anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but I thought that's what I wanted to do. And I got to be about 17 
My life has hit a dead end. I said that, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't like what's happening to me. I don't like what I'm doing. And I said, Lord, is there anything in this life that's real? And the Lord showed me exactly where to head in. As a matter of fact, I was raised in church. But you know how the devil will blind you about the, the truth and make you think that, well, you know, uh, the church people are just, you know, they're, they're hypocrites. Well, I was a bigger hypocrite than they were. Because I professed to be saved as a young man. Baptized and everything at the age of 10. And just lived like the devil for eight years. When I was 18 years old, somebody preached to me on the street, witnessed to me on the street where I was hanging around. And I got under conviction. And I got saved July the 9th, 1974. And folks, I've never, I've never been sorry since. It's been 38 years. And that's when my life took on meaning. But, but before that, I was just like the, these folks that came to David. Now look in the scripture. Let's see here this type fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice it says, everyone that was in distress. Hold your hand there and turn to Matthew. The book of Matthew chapter number 11. Matthew chapter number 11. A tremendous, tremendous passage of scripture. In Matthew chapter 11 verse 28, the Bible says... Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You say, Brother Mitch, wait a minute. Since I've been saved by the grace of God, I've had trouble, well, so have I. I've had stage 3 cancer, and they told me I had a 3% chance of living, and here I am today. Amen. Amen. Now, you explain that to me. I'll explain it. If the Lord wants you here, you'll be here. If He wants you gone, you'll be gone. That's Amen. the way it is. Amen. I have had to reconcile that in my mind with good preacher friends of mine, like Jim Lentz and David Reagan. The cancer is taken out of this world. I've had to say, why? Them and not me. But the Lord showed me under no uncertain terms, you're going to be here until I want you gone. So you know what I do? I wake up in the morning and stand what says saying, Well, another day. Now I say, Well, another day. Now, folks, I'm telling you, you come close to death, you uh, appreciate life. But look at this. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, how can the Lord say that considering what some Christians have gone through? Well, that's easy, folks. Because when you get saved, you don't carry the burden alone. He carries it with you. Amen? And what's even better than that, it's not going to last forever. Amen. Folks, there's people that go through this life 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, even 100 years without Jesus Christ and they die rejecting Christ. They have a tough life while they're here and they die and they spend eternity in a lake of fire. Isn't that a terrible thing? I'm glad I got saved as a fairly young man. I wish I got saved when I was eight. But I'm glad I got saved because you know something? Sin leaves no man or no woman better than it finds them. Amen. Amen. Never has, never will. You young people that are saved now, you better thank God for it every day. Amen. You say, well, Brother Mitch, I've never done these things that you did. Thank God for that too. Amen. Folks, a greater testimony for a child of God is never having been in sin like that because you've got less to remember. Amen. Now the devil will say, don't you, don't you miss doing this, that, and the other? I don't miss it because I went through it and I know how God brought me out on the other side. But let me tell you something, young folks. Don't ever let the devil pull that one on you. Don't ever think about what you're missing or let your friends tell you you're missing. Only thing you're missing is heartache and trouble. Right. I can testify to that firsthand right here. I'm 57 years old. Right now, I know I look older than that, but I've been road hard and put up wet. Amen. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Mom has given me plenty of TLC the last 37 years we've been married. But I know I look older than 57, but that's how old I am. But let me tell you something. This last 38 years of salvation has been sweet, 
I mean, it's been, it's been better than anything I ever experienced in my first 18 years. Amen. And I thank God for it. But listen, I was in distress. Look over in 2 second, second Thessalonians. Jesus Christ said, my yoke is easy, my burden's light. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to believe that. I'm going to believe that. And, and, and I don't like, when I preach, I don't like to give personal illustrations of myself, but folks, I, I can tell you, the Lord will bring you through some things you don't ever think you're going to get through. Amen. And can I say this? Will you allow me to say this? I was standing in front of the mirror back in 2006, and I was standing there, and I lost down 160 pounds. Of course, you can tell I found it all again. <laughs> But the, the, the cancer messed my thyroid up, which uh, messed my heart up. The thyroid blew my weight back up. That's a good excuse. That pizza. <laughs> but anyway, I stood there before that mirror, and I had an ileostomy bag on. That's when they had my intestines on the outside. And uh, they had to take 10 inches of my intestines out. And, and I, I stood there, and I told my wife, I said, look at me. Look at me. I said, my eyes were sunk back in my head. My face was pasty white. I looked like warmed over death. That's the same thing my mother used to say when I was a kid. And I, I told her, and I, and I hate to admit this, young fellas. I hate to admit I said this, but I said, if I knew this was going to be like this the rest of my life, I would take a gun and blow my head off. You know, the Lord heard that. And He gave me strength. And He gave me grace. And I'm here today. Things are, things are different. I have to eat differently. I, I get tired easy. I wear out easy. But listen, I'm here. I'm breathing. Amen. Amen. You know what that does for me? That does a lot for me, folks. Amen. I'm going to tell you. And my wife stood by me through thick and thin. I about drove her crazy. I mean, the cancer affected my nervous system. I got paranoid. And, uh, and I'm telling you, I've never been in such a shape. And I hope and pray to God, Lord, hear me, that I haven't have to go through that again. But I, I was seeing black helicopters come flying over the house. And, of course, they were flying over the house, but I thought they were coming for me, you know. And, and I was just paranoid. Folks, I was, I was in distress, even as a child of God. The Lord brought me through it. He did. He won't leave you. We'll get to that. We'll get to that in a minute. But look at this. Look at look at first at Second Thessalonians chapter one. Second Thessalonians chapter one. I'm here to tell you, living for God is the only life to live. Amen. It takes a real man and a real woman to live for God. Amen. I got a message I preach called "Any Old Dead Fish." <laughs> Any old dead fish can float downstream. Yeah. Really? But it takes a live fish swim upstream against the current. It takes a real man and a real woman to live for God 2012. I'll tell you that. It's going to get worse, too. <laughs> All right, look at this. Second, you say, Brother Mitch, you're a real prophet of doom? No, I'm a Bible believer. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's what our Bible says. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, look at it, verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endured. Now there's grace age endurance. That's not tribulation endurance in the tribulation period like they're going to have to do in the tribulation. I'm a Bible believer. I believe in rightly dividing the word. Amen. I'm a dispensation. I'm not a hyper dispensationalist, but I'm a strong dispensationalist. Amen. I continue, you can't be a Bible believer unless you are. Right, Somewhere you're going to have to go to the Hebrew or the Greek to try to straighten your Bible out if you don't believe in rightly dividing the word. Amen. Folks, I see it all the time. You know, I was born at night, but not last night. Yeah. So I've seen this stuff. <laughs> Look at this. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Folks, in this life, if you're a Christian, you're going to suffer persecution. Amen. That's all there is to it, if you unless you compromise. And then if you compromise, the Lord's going to beat the daylights out of you. So you might as well just go ahead and just live for God and let it go. Amen. Amen. I decided that a long time ago. You've got to be oblivious. To what the public says about you. Amen. If you're living right and clean and pure like you're supposed to. Now if you're not, 
you've got a problem. Now he says, verse 6, singing is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, look at it, rest with us. Folks, you just sometimes just need rest. The human body's got to have rest. And you've got to have spiritual rest. And you know where I get rest? When I come here and here to preach the Word of God and get with God's people. I get strengthened. I get, I get encouragement. I get lifted up. No man is an island, folks. No man liveth on himself. No one dieth on himself. You can't make it on your own. You've got to have the Lord first, and you've got to have God's people too. Amen. That's right. Exactly right. Amen. Now look at this. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Your pastor would say the same thing. Rest with us. Come and hear the Word of God. Get strengthened. Eat some food. Fellowship. Find out that you're all in the same boat. That's what fellowship is. It's a bunch of fellows in the same ship. Amen. <laughs> That's what it is. And ladies, you know, I mean, you, can, you people up here say you guys for girls, so I guess that's okay. <laughs> All right, but look at this. It says, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified the saints. To be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Look at it. Folks, listen. I know there's a lot of bad things going on. I know that. But you know something? God's keeping a record. God knows all about it. You know, has it ever occurred to you that nothing's ever occurred to God? Amen. Amen. He knows everything. He knows everything. Amen. Folks, He's much more than sovereign. He's potentate. Yes. That's the Bible word. Supreme authority. Amen. Amen. Rest from distress. That's great. Number two, I want you to notice. Go back in our text now. And notice it says, And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt. You ever been in debt? <laughs> you, ever, you ever been in debt? <laughs> Folks, if you're living, you're in debt. You say, well, I got everything paid for. Your power bill paid ahead, is it? How about your grocery bill? They just bring groceries to your house for free? No, folks, if you want to live, you want to be in debt to somebody. But listen, our debt goes a whole lot farther. Look, look over in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. And you know, some of you know where I'm going with this, but look at Luke chapter 7. Everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt. Where did they run to? Well, they ran to David. You say, why? Well, he's the type of Christ. Did they know that? No. But the Lord did. Look at Luke chapter number 7 and verse number 36. The Bible said, every one of the Pharisees, excuse me, and one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping, began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. That's humility. You've got to get down on your knees to do that. Folks. Now look, my head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, 
For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? Well, I'll tell you who he was. He was Jehovah God manifest the flesh. Amen. That's who he was. That's who he is. Now look. And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. You know, it's no wonder that Jesus Christ himself said that the publicans and sinners will go into the kingdom before you, you Pharisees and Sadducees. This man didn't bother to humble himself. This woman did. And God saved her. He had the power on earth to forgive sins. Amen. How about that? Listen. She was in debt. But that's not all. Look at Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter 6. We were, folks, everybody sitting in this building, if you're saved, you owe a debt that you could not pay. Yes, sir. How in the world can people today think they can work their way into heaven? If you could work your way in, Christ would not have to come and die. Amen. That's right. The Lord will just give you a Bible and say, now do the best you can. Help your fellow man. I mean, be good to everybody. Don't kick the dog. Don't you know, fuss at your wife. You know, don't whip the kid. <laughs> and then you'll make it in. But that's what people, hey folks, I meet people every day. And you ask them if they're saved. They say, well, I'm, try I'm trying to be. I'm doing the best I can. Can I say this this morning? The best you and I can do is not good enough. That's right. That's right. It took a sinless man to live a sinless life that has sinless blood to be shed to save us from our sins. Amen. That's the only way we're going to get in. Amen? Now look at this. Romans chapter 6, verse 20. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. See that? He says, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know what that's called in 2 Peter 2.15? It said, Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness. The wages of unrighteousness. I was working for that when I before I got saved, I was working my way right straight to hell. That's what I was doing. And that's what people are doing out here today. You got religious people in religious buildings today that think that they're going to go to heaven because of what they've done the past week to help their fellow man. What good deeds they've done and the man behind the pulpit's telling them that because he don't know God either. Not only in Pennsylvania and North Carolina it's going on. Amen. Amen. What the brother read this morning, the book of Matthew chapter 25, you'd be amazed how many people read that and think that's how you're going to heaven by doing what he read this morning. Amen. And you know what I know, if you know your Bible, that's dealing with the judgment of the nations after the tribulation period and what the Gentile did with the Jew during the tribulation period, that's going to be the reward of the millennial kingdom. It's all works, 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 works. You've done unto the least of these, my brethren. You've done it unto me. Well, that's nothing new. That went on in the book of Esther. Those, those people became Jews for fear of the Jew. The tribulation period, they protect the Jew to get God's favor. Gentile. That's not us. We're out of here. Amen. We're not going to be here. If you're saved this morning, you're not going to see that. Amen. You're going to be out of here. Right. Amen. Isn't this Bible a wonderful book? Amen. Amen. Sure is. Folks, go back to our text now. I can say a whole lot more about that, but look at this. Everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented. What is discontented? That's the opposite of contented. <laughs> look over in Hebrews chapter 13. Like I said, that's the only time you will find that word in your King James Bible, discontented. The only reference. Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, verse 5. The Bible says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, 
nor forsake thee. So that ye may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I've had people tell me, Well, he won't leave me, but I can leave him. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Hold the phone here a minute. Ha! Uh, you're more powerful than God will know. Well, how are you going to leave a God that won't leave you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> people say, Well, uh, I know the Bible says in John 10 that no man shall pluck you out of my hand, you know. But, uh, you know, I can walk out. I said, you can walk out of God's hand? Yeah, yeah, I can. I said, wait a minute. I said, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that God meted out the waters with the span of his hand. He put the waters on the earth out of his hand. Wouldn't you say that's a pretty good sized hand? <laughs> <laughs> you better start walking. <laughs> people, why do people think when they make statements like that? Folks, listen. I'm not only in his hand. I'm a part of his hand. Yes, you're right. The Bible said we're members of, of him, of his body. In Ephesians chapter 5. I'm a part of his hand. I can't walk out and take God's hand with me. And folks, I know it's the same way up in Pennsylvania. Everybody sitting here, as soon as I said that, somebody came to your mind that professed to get saved, and they run well for a while, and the next thing you know, they're back out here living in sin. We got them down south too in North Carolina. Some of them free will Baptist churches down there, people come in and make them 15 professions. That's pretty convenient when you want to go out and commit some sin somewhere. Yeah. So, well, I lost it. Go out and commit sin, come back, get it again. Whoop, holler and shout. That's the way they do it. My mother was raised in Free Will Baptist Church, said she's seen people get saved 12, 15 times. B.R. Lakin, you know, the old Baptist preacher, a lady came up to him one time and said, Brother Lakin, pray for me. I just got saved for the 12th time. He looked at her, he said, Lady, you got saved 12 times. You better pray for me. I've only been saved once. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way Brother Lakin was. He was a character. Amen. But listen, he says, he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Amen? Amen. Listen, listen. You're discontented? God can make you contented. Look over in 1 Timothy. You say, Brother Mitch, when you preach, you use, you use a lot of scripture. But don't the Bible say preach the word? Amen. Amen. Now, I know that don't go on up here in Pennsylvania. I know that. But down in North Carolina, we got fellows down there that are preaching every quarter verse of Scripture the whole time they preach. They might read a text verse, but they never quote, they chase rabbits down one holler and up the other holler and chase, that's all they do. They never refer to the Bible again. Listen, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear people's ideas and opinions. The Bible says preach the Word. Amen. Isn't that what y'all want to hear? The word? Amen. Amen. Well, and, and, and you got some preaching down in our area. It's, it's what we call skyscraper preaching. It's just one story right after the other. <laughs> I'm not interested in their dog, my dog ship stories either. Folks, listen. Preach the word. I'll give some illustrations. Nothing wrong with illustrations, but a man's whole message should be illustration. Folks, we need to know this book. This world is painfully ignorant of this King James Bible. Amen. That's why I always have and always will in my preaching use a lot of scripture. Because that's what the Bible says to do. Amen. <laughs> Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 6, verse 3. 1 Timothy 6, 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to God, let me stop right there and say that will sort of knock a hyper dispensationalist in the head that says Christ's words are not important, only the Apostle Paul. Paul himself said, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, said, You, you listen to wholesome words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I believe that. Amen. I look. He is proud, knowing nothing. So he must be an agnostic. That's what agnostic means, a non-knower. So he must be an agnostic. 
but doting about questions and strifes of words whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, you know I've got to throw this in. That verse 5, supposing that gain is godliness, every translation on the market changes that. Supposing that godliness is a means of gain. Uh-uh. No. They suppose if you got gained and you're godly. Yeah. Just like your Bible says. Mm. So I guess that means the kingdom halls, they must be the godless people around. Or, I know where I'm at, Roman Catholicism, with the trillions of dollars they got, they must be real godly. Think about it just a minute, folks. What you've got, what you've gained is not a sign of godliness. Amen. That's what the world thinks. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. You've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. <laughs> never. <laughs> never. When that soul leaves that body, you, 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 that's it. You're not taking anything with you. The fellow said, if I can't take it with me, I'm not going. <laughs> well, you will when God says go. Yes, now look. Uh, I saw a bumper sticker one time that said, He's that, He that dies with the most toys wins. That's just about the dumbest bumper sticker I've ever seen since I found it <laughs> back in the 70s. All right, now, notice. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Folks, there's not very many people sitting here, I doubt, that God hadn't given much more than just food and raiment. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. That's right. Well, most of us probably got more than one suit of clothes, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Amen. God has been good to us. Amen. We may not be millionaires, but look, if God gave me a million dollars, I'd probably mess up and spend it on something I wasn't supposed to anyway. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now look at this. Look back in our text and notice this. And I'll be done in a little bit. He says, everyone that was discontented, what did they do? They gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. They gathered themselves together. They were determined. You know what these people had to go through, this 400 had to go through to get to David? They had to worry about crossing Saul. He was the king. But they made their way down to that cave of Dullam where David was at because they knew David was right. I've got a message I preach, and I'm not going to preach this week, I don't guess called the high cost of compromise. You know that Jonathan should not have died with his father out there on Mount Gilboa? If Jonathan would have done what he's supposed to have done, knowing what he knew about David, he would have gone with David and left his father because he knew his father was full of the devil. Yes. If Jonathan would have left his father and followed David, he'd still be alive when, John, when Saul, Saul was killed. That's why David lamented the way he did about Saul and Jonathan dying. You know where Mount Geboa is at? Mount Geboa is in the, right overlooking the valley of Esdron, the plains of Megiddo. Do you know that's the place the Antichrist is going to die? That's the place the Antichrist is going to be defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ in the second advent? That was a fitting place maybe for Saul to die, but not Jonathan. I contend that Jonathan died out of the will of God. I believe he did. Because mm -hmm. you remember one time when they hugged one another and it said David went back out in the woods and Jonathan went home to his house. What Jonathan should have done was follow David. Yeah. He said, but that was his father. His father was full of the devil. Mm -hmm. The Spirit of God had left him. But that's another message. But listen, they were determined. They were determined. You remember over in Luke chapter 5? We'll look over in Luke chapter 5. <coughs> we won't read all of this, but I want you to see Luke chapter 5. <coughs> in Luke chapter 5, verse number 17. So it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee 
in Judea, Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. They made an effort, and it was not for them. It was for someone else. That's what the Christian life is about. You know, that's what the word joy stands for. Jesus, others, you. We don't like it that way, do we? <laughs> but, that's what, but that's what it's all about. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop, let him down through the tiling with his couch to the midst before Jesus. How's that for determination? They made the effort. They were determined to get to Jesus. And look at this. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. It didn't say when he saw the man's faith. He saw the faith of the men that brought him in. They were determined. And Jesus Christ answered their prayer, Heal this man and save him. How about that? And of course the Pharisees got upset about that. But I mean, they were determined. Look over in, look over in Mark 5. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. This woman had an issue of blood. Notice with me. Verse 25, Mark 5, 25. A certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. Wouldn't you say that was desperation? I mean, she spent all her money and she still wasn't well. Look at this. When she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind him and touched his garment. That's her faith exercised. She exercised her faith. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. She had to fight through that crowd to get to him. But she was determined. Even in her weakened condition, no doubt, she walked through the crowd that was pressing up against him. The Bible says they, they thronged him. They thronged him. She fought through that crowd and touched his garment. And as soon as he did, she did. He knew that virtue had gone out of him. She had exercised faith and said, if I can but just touch his garment, she touched him and God healed her. Look at this. And straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. She got success. After desperation, after faith exercise, she was determined to get to Jesus Christ. God answered her prayer and healed her. Folks, that's the same way these people that came down to David. They came down, they knew if we can get down to David, although we're in debt, although we're discontented, all these things we're having to deal with, and dealing with Saul and him being full of the devil and what he's done to the kingdom. If we can get to David, we can get some help. That's exactly the way it was when I got saved. If I can get to Jesus, I can get some help. Amen. I came to Jesus, and guess what? He helped me. Amen. He helped me. Amen. Satan will blind you. You'll become oblivious uh, to the things of God. He'll blind you to the things of this world until it's too late. Don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. Lastly, and I'm done. Okay, back in our text, notice it said, He became a captain over them. And they were with him about 400 men. They came to him, they were determined, and he delivered them. You agree? Amen. 400 men came down to him. Made the way. Of, independently of what Saul thought. Or of the danger incorporated in it. They said if we can get to David. We can get some help. We can get to Jesus. We'll get some help. And David delivered them. They came down there and banded together. They delivered of their debt. They delivered of their discontentment. Traveling with David, they didn't have to worry about being discontented, amen? They always had food. Saul had messed the kingdom up to such a point where God's blessings had turned away from Israel. So they knew the right one to get to. Jonathan knew the right one to get to. Jonathan knew it as soon as he saw David. Their, their souls were knit together as one. And what did Jonathan do? He gave him his bow. That's a sign of submission, subjection. I know you're the one that's going to be on the throne after my father and not me. Jonathan knew that. What he should have done is gone all the way and been one of these 400. Amen. You agree with that, folks? Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. Look at this. He became the captain over them. Three short places and I'm done. 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1. 
2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 8. 2 Corinthians 1 8. 2 Corinthians 1 8, the Bible says, We would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch we despaired even of life. Has that ever happened to you? Has that ever happened to you? Let me tell you something, when it does, he'll still be with you. Amen. You know what the devil will do? The devil will bring you to such, he'll bring you. My pastor one time uh, talked about being in a courtroom and he saw a guy that they, that they took before the judge and he committed crimes and he was standing before the judge and his legs, it was behind him and his legs were just shaking. You know what the devil did? He traveled with that guy to the point where he had to face the music and then he left him. And he was on his own. That's what the devil will do, young people. He'll make the bright lights look appealing. He'll make the alcohol and drugs look appealing. He'll make the people you shouldn't hang around look appealing. But when trouble comes, he leaves and you're left on your own. Yeah. Jesus Christ will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Now look at this. But we have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. But in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Isn't that great to be able to lay your head on your pillow at night and know that whatever happens, whatever happens, the Lord's with you. Yeah. You can't beat that. Amen. Amen. You can't beat that. First Thessalonians 1. 1 Thessalonians 1. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 6, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living, I mean, turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which hath delivered us from the wrath to come. I'm not going to be here during the tribulation. That's right, amen. amen. What is the tribulation? Oh, the Bible says it's the time of Jacob's trouble. <coughs> Are you Jacob? No. Jacob's Israel. That's the time of Israel's trouble. You say, well, Brother Mitch, when, is the, when, when are we going to have our trouble? Where have you been for the last 2,000 years? <laughs> <laughs> you know our Baptist ancestors were burned at the stake over what mode this should be administered? Yeah. Rather than compromise with Catholicism and Puritanism and many of the other isms, they died? Amen. Many of them were drowned and held under till they drowned. Said, you want immersion? We'll immerse you. And they drowned. Our Baptist ancestors. Do you know your pastor's name? Ireland. You know James Ireland in Virginia. I mean James Ireland refused to compromise and was in prison time and time and time and time and time again. I'll bet he's kin to him somewhere down the line. John Weatherford. James Ireland. Two great Virginia preachers. Baptists just like your pastor. Separate Baptists. Which is where the independent Baptists came from. Went to jail rather than compromise. With the jail rather than deny this King James Bible. And today, Baptists today are throwing it out the window, taking Baptists off their church sign, getting rid of the pulpit. Yeah. All in the name of Rick Warren. Mm -hmm. And the purpose driven church movement, which is right straight out of the pits of hell. Mm -hmm. Lastly, and I'm done. Not only are we delivered from death, like Paul said there in the, spirit, in the Spirit of God, we're delivered from the wrath to come. You say, well, I think I'm going to do the tribulation. Help yourself, I'm not. When the Lord says, come up here, I'm going to Hank Snow, I'm moving on. <laughs> Amen. Now look, Romans 8, we're done. You said, Brother Mitch, you said that a while ago. Well, even Paul said, finally, brethren, and preached for two more chapters. <laughs> 
I'm not better than the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter, <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Look at it. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit of adoption. When you got saved, you received in you the spirit of adoption. Now look at it. The Bible says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Look what Paul said. Good old southern phrase. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature went for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself all shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption, look at it, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together till now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, that's a legal term, to find that which proceeds and sign what follows, to wit, the redemption of our body. When you and I got saved, we received the spirit of adoption. That's a down payment. Yes. On this body being delivered when the Lord comes, then we receive the redemption of our body. See, I'm only half saved. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got in trouble up in Carolina for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my soul and spirit saved, but this body, it's not going. Amen. Flesh and blood is not going to inherit the kingdom of God, so it's going to have to be changed. So I'm only half saved. And that spirit of adoption that's in you, and you're saved here this morning, you have the spirit of adoption. So I don't feel like it, but you are if you're saved. And when he comes, he's going to redeem your vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able to redeem all things unto himself. Isn't that a blessing? Yeah. Amen. Conclusion. So we'll be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Yes. We're chained to a dead man. Yeah. And we're trying to live with Christ with a dead man chained to us. <laughs> that's tough sometimes. <laughs> Back on the battlefield many years ago in many of your wars, that's how they kept prisoners on the battlefield. When, I, when, they didn't, when they couldn't get in there to get the prisoners out, they were chained them to a dead corpse. You're not going to drag a dead corpse off the battlefield with bullets going over your head, so they had to just lay there. But in essence, folks, that's what is wrong with us this morning. We're saved, but we've got this vile body we have to deal with. Yeah. And we constantly have to put it under subjection. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to go to church this morning. You go, you're going whether you want to go or not. That's <laughs> what you have to do. That's yeah. what you have to do. Conclusion. All the wonderful types of Jesus Christ. We've already talked about Joseph. We talked about Isaac and Joshua. All these are types, and it's over and over and over again. You've got 21 types of Jesus Christ, 3 times 7. 18 types of Antichrist, 3 times 8. I mean, 3 times 6. That's good North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I stuck my foot in my mouth there, didn't I? 3 times 6. That's the number of the beast. I mean, this is some Bible we've got here, folks. But listen, listen. All of them serve to prove the Bible is one unit. This Bible is one unit. You, you start in Genesis, you go to Revelation, and you realize I'm back in Genesis again. This Bible is one unit. This is the most miraculous book on the face of God's earth. You say, well, I believe the original Hebrew and Greek. Well, you don't have the original Hebrew and Greek. And there's 24 Greek texts extant today. Which ones are right and which ones are wrong? If they come out of Alexandria, they're all wrong. So. And you got two main Hebrew texts. Which one of those is right? I'll tell you which one's right. The Masoretic text this Bible came from. Amen. Can I throw this in while I'm pitching this morning? Do you realize if you've got a New King James Version, that your Old Testament derived from the same Hebrew manuscript as the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses? 
Not only that, if you've got an NIV this morning, the same 16 verses that are omitted out of the NIV are left out of the New World Translation. You say, why? Same text. Same text. Now, folks, there's no excuse for having anything on your lap this morning with this King James Bible. Amen. Amen. Now, I don't know if we'll get into that this week. I don't know. This is not a Bible conference. It's a revival meeting. Your pastor is gracious enough to give us the liberty. So we're going to do I'm going to try to follow the Spirit of God every day and every night. Amen. Amen. Listen, you know him this morning? Is he the captain of your salvation? I trust everyone here saved this morning. But we need to be reminded every once in a while just exactly what he's done for us. Thank God we have a captain to fight our battles for us. Amen. The battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord. And my Bible tells me in Exodus 15 that our God, our Lord, is a man of war. He's a man of war. He can fight any battle that you and I have to face. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Thank God for the glorious liberty in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, Amen brother. Amen. I'm going to my son. Come, Phil, come. As we sing this morning, the altar's open. If you're here this morning and you've never been saved, if you don't know for sure that you're saved and on your way to heaven this morning, you're in a heap of trouble. Amen? Amen. The Lord can do something about that for you. So why don't you come? If you're, not here, if you're here this morning and you don't know for sure that you're saved, why don't you come to the altar this morning? So now the Bible show you how you can know for sure. And if you're here this morning and you are saved, maybe there's some distresses, maybe there's some things that are on you this morning. Why don't you come to the altar? Why don't you give them to the Lord this morning? Why don't you let Him take it? Because He can take it. So the Lord spoke to you this morning. Anyway, if you need to come to the altar and deal with it, why don't you come as we sing? Let's take our hymnals and turn to hymn number 271. Lord, I'm coming home. Stand together. As we sing, the altar's open. Why don't you come? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 